He'll give the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. With five seconds, he's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. There is a flag down. But holy smokes. Duke two and four in overtime games. Carolina one and three. Here from under center. Give off to Greg Little. Little pulls away. Little is going to score. Carolina wins. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Parker <laughs> with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it. Possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burns. In his end zone. The punt, very high. Switzer will have room to return it. He fields it at the 40. Coming near side, Switzer at the 50. Switzer, 45, cuts back at the 40. 35, breaks a tackle at the 30. Still on his feet. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Ryan Switzer for six. He is doing his best Giovanni Bernard impression. Ryan Switzer again. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it for a touchdown. Are you kidding me? What is going on, guys? Anthony Pagnotta here, back with you guys. We're doing the live stream again, uh, and the internet is working good as of right now. Uh, I literally ran a test of it here just right before we got started. Now, look, this podcast is recording. I do have uh, the audio edition of it recording. So if for some reason some things go wrong here uh, and so, you know we, we end up having to sort of abort mission or whatever, we do have the audio edition that will be available for you. But I wanted to get on here, wanted to break down – Carolina's recruiting class that they brought in today in the 2024 class. Also talk to you a little bit about uh, the comments from Mac Brown earlier today uh, when it comes to what we saw in, from the locker room footage after the NC State game. And you may be asking, why is Mac Brown waiting until now to respond to this? Well, the simple fact of the matter is, is that uh, this is, you know, the first time that Mac Brown has spoken since that game. He did speak in the post game, but you would imagine that in the post game of that one, uh, he probably hadn't yet seen the footage. Um, so he has had a little bit of time. Clearly, he has been sitting on this. He has been waiting. He has wanted to respond to this. So I'll let you guys know what I think about that. Um, maybe I'll do that right here off the top because we got a bunch of people that are in here. I want to hear your comments as well. What do you think? about what uh, Mac Brown said about Dave Doran. Um, and, and look, he, he came out, he, he basically just said, look, uh, those that, that was classless. He's never heard uh, anybody say that about college kids before. Um, and I got to, you know, agree with him to a certain extent. Now, the thing is, is that behind closed doors, this is probably something that's said uh, relatively routinely. I know, you know, as a passionate fan myself, I've definitely said stuff like that before, I'm not going to lie to you guys. You guys know who I am from uh, my time on the air at, at, at Sports Radio 92.7 WFNZ. I'm a passionate dude. Um, and I think a lot of us fans are probably like that. Now, the thing is, is that when you, um, you know, when you look at this from the perspective of a head coach saying this, I don't think it's the greatest look in the world. Don't get it wrong. Uh, if it was our head coach that was being called out for something like this, it probably wouldn't be the greatest feeling. Um, but, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, honestly, it's probably something that, you know, goes on a lot more uh, than you realize. Now, uh, he said 
uh, Dave Doran did. He spoke earlier today as well. Issued, you know, sort of a, a half-hearted apology. Um, I thought it was kind of pathetic. Honestly, you're supposed to be this hard ass. You act like you're uh, this tough guy. Saw you plenty of times at media day. That's the same way that you act. But then you come back and uh, basically try to issue a half-assed apology, which you didn't mean. Um, which, if you're a real man, then you wouldn't uh, you you wouldn't issue an apology at all. Um, you know, although maybe that was forced by their athletic department. Who really knows? Um, the other part of that that I found just hilarious from his perspective uh, was him saying that he did not uh, he, he did not know that there was a camera in the locker room. Here's the thing about that. Um, don't think it was an ESPN camera that was in the locker room. Almost certain it wasn't a camera that was in the locker room. Uh, it was more than likely a camera that was being handheld by one of your social media people. You should know that, especially in the modern era, that there is always going to be someone from your social media team that is going to be in there, that is going to be uh, filming that. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, it's honestly probably pretty embarrassing if you're NC State, that your head football coach is acting like he didn't realize that that was going on in there. Not saying that he thought that that he was on camera or anything like that. Maybe he didn't. Um, but here's the thing: uh, there should be some. Th th there needs to be a conversation then within your own athletic department because clearly somebody that's a part of your social media staff or whatever felt like it was smart to put that out there. So. Um, I, I did, you know, from his perspective, look, this is not something that uh, it shocks me at all about Dave Doran. This is the type of guy that he is. He puts on this tough guy act. Um, I don't really think he's a dude that if he ever got squared up with would probably be able to respond, but, um, who knows? Uh, the thing for Mac Brown though, is, is that, uh, he comes out, he calls it classless, but here's the thing about it. Yes, it is classless. Not a great look. I think it's, you know, I, I wouldn't even really go with classless. I think it's more of a lack of professionalism. It's almost a little bit childish. The thing is, is that for Mac Brown, whatever he's doing over there clearly is working. So all these things that he's telling these guys in their locker room, um, you know, it, it is it is paying off. It's working. And these kids are are buying into it. I'm not saying that this is the route that you need Carolina to go. I like the way that Carolina runs their program. I like the way that Mac Brown runs his. And, uh, you know, today what you saw from Mac Brown was him standing up for his players. And I, you got to respect Mac Brown for doing that because some coaches would just move on and act like, ah, you know, it's not a big deal. We, we, we got to be better. I like that he stood up for his players. But at the same time, I do think that, this is, you know, a situation where Mac Brown, I'm not saying that he has to be saying these types of things in the locker room, but again, you can tell that there is a culture of hatred, the, the, the mindset that you should be taking towards a rival. And we've talked about it at length here on this podcast. Uh, we talked about it after the game against NC State, that there just doesn't seem to be the same amount of hatred that for NC State from Carolina players as hatred towards Carolina from NC State players. And you can see why, because their head coach is, is a guy that absolutely hates the team that's on the other side. He admitted that on the ACC network. Um, I think with Mac Brown, you want to see from him, you want to see from the rest of the coaches. And this is why I really think that, you know, if there are former Tar Heels that are interested in getting into coaching, Having them on the staff would be a good idea because they know it. They've lived the rivalry. This has been a fierce rivalry for a long, long time. It's one of the more underrated rivalries, I think, in all of college football. And today really only added to it. But you need that hatred on the other side. You don't have to go as far as, as to say this. Uh, I respect the hell out of Mac Brown being a guy that wouldn't say those types of things. But at the same time, this is not a situation where – year in and year out, you can go into your press conference and be, you know, basically praising these players that are on the other side of this rivalry. That's what he did this year. He spent his entire press conference talking about how, um, how great, you know, Brennan Armstrong was, some of the other guys that were on that roster. Well, in the meantime, in the pregame speech, and I mean, 
even, you know, beforehand, if you look at the pressers, I mean, Dave Doran wasn't complimenting Carolina players. He then goes into his pregame speech and wall on camera, calls these guys pieces of bleep. Um, they, I mean, I mean, that's, that's the thing is that it's two completely different mindsets. And one is winning out right now. You need more hatred from Carolina players towards NC State players. It doesn't need to go past the professional level. You want to remain, uh, I mean, professional and respectful uh, in a certain manner. But at the same time, you want to see a little bit of that vitriol. And hopefully this is one of those things. Mac Brown, you know, the way that he talked today, that's something that you would expect will stick with Carolina moving forward. You knew you would expect that that video is something that's going to get played over and over again, but that needs to be the mindset in the off season. I said it today on Twitter and I'll say it again here. I think that the mindset from Mac Brown and his staff should be, you need to come out. Uh, and anytime this gets brought up, anytime NC state's name gets brought up, anytime that game gets brought up heading into next season and moving forward, this is a moment that you turn back to. You remember this moment. You put you, you you print that out. You put it up on a bulletin board. You do whatever you have to do. This has to be something that actually fuels you. We heard from the players. We heard uh, a little bit from Mac Brown about how the planting of the flag at midfield uh, last year was going to serve as motivation in the game this year. It sure as hell didn't. And uh, it's something that, you know, we probably shouldn't believe shouldn't have believed was going to serve as motivation. This this better serve as motivation, because if this doesn't, then you've got the wrong type of players that are playing for you. You have to find guys that actually care about the name that is on the front of the jersey, even though it's technically not on the front of the jersey, but that care about the logo that I'm wearing on my head right now that they're wearing on their helmets and that care about their own pride over um, you, you know, caring about the name on the back of their jersey, which at times you've had to question whether or not they actually do. Well, that's the conversation about what Mac Brown said earlier today uh, on Dave Doran's comments from back uh, a couple of months ago, about almost or a couple of weeks ago, actually nearing about a month ago now um, since that game. Thank God that is getting further and further away. Uh, but now let's turn to the early signing class for the Tar Heels that they brought in today. We'll talk a little bit about that. And boy, this is a huge haul for Carolina. 27 players overall uh, committed to the class. This is with losing a guy yesterday in Keenan Jackson, the three-star wide receiver commit that did apparently, I don't know, got inspired by Dave Doran's comments and went over to the other side. Um, it is what it is. I addressed that last night on the edition of the podcast and said, look, it's, it's something that Carolina – I uh, can't just pass off. He was a guy that would have been a great fit for Carolina, um, especially, you know, uh, coming off the season that he had at Weddington High School this past year. A uh, guy that I think really could have de developed into something uh, in this, you know, under the tutelage of Lonnie Galloway in this wide receiving core. But look, he's going to NC State. Carolina is still more than fine. And so you look at the class rankings overall, 24 7 sports. Ranks the Carolinas class number 26 overall in the country, uh, number four in the ACC. Rivals number 22 in the country, number four uh, in the ACC. ESPN uh, number 26 overall in the country, number five in the ACC. Now, if you go and look, you may say to yourself, how is Carolina number five? Carolina is number five because uh, they are – uh, ranked behind Stanford. You always have to remember now moving forward, starting with this year, whenever you look at recruiting rankings or anything like that, Stanford, Cal, and SMU are always going to be involved in those rankings. So you may look, you may go through if you're someone that wants to sort of, uh, you know, look it up for yourself and you may say, wait, I, I see Florida State, Miami, Clemson ahead of them. Who's the other one? It is Stanford. Um, but again, that's only on ESPN, their rankings uh, kind of all over the place. I uh, really uh, all over the place just in general going through a lot of the guys here. I won't read through that. There's the article on the website uh, that you guys can check out where it kind of ranks each guy on the major sites, 24-7 sports, rivals, ESPN, on three, 
uh, as well as the composite ranking from 24-7 Sports. Uh, so you guys can go check that out if you're interested uh, in diving a little bit deeper on how the different sites rank these guys. Um, but overall, pretty solid class on three, by the way, has Carolina as the number 26 overall class and number four in the ACC. So a solid class for Carolina. Uh, didn't pack the punch that some of the classes in recent years have in terms of of big names, but still a really, really good group that I think Carolina uh, can build off of. A lot of guys with plenty of upside and versatility that we'll talk about here. And how I think we're going to do it is let's go position group by position group, and we'll go how you typically go. And the way I've always gone is kind of how you went through it on Madden, if you're someone that played that when you were younger, or even if you played the college football game. Starts on the offensive side of the ball. And we'll start at the quarterback position. Uh, only one guy brought in in this class, uh, one that was sorely needed and even more so now uh, with where Carolina is at in terms of numbers in that quarterback room. They are only going to have two guys that will be on the active roster when they take the field in Charlotte, Connor Harrell and uh, Tad Hudson. You will also, of course, have the transfer that's coming in in Max Johnson. But Michael Merdinger could be the future of this position group. And remember back when Carolina landed Michael Merdinger, you kind of wondered, okay, what is Carolina getting in him? He was a guy that didn't start last year at Cardinal Gibbons High School, set behind a guy that uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, um, Dylan Risk, I think he was an Iowa commit. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but then Merdinger, you know, goes out. Um, rem I, I remember the quote very vividly on uh, the tr the uh, the the uh, circuit uh, that they do in the off season of all these camps. Uh, apparently, was called by someone hot as fish grease, and Caroline had jumped in on him. Uh, remember, at that time, they were scrambling. They missed on a couple of high end four star quarterbacks that they were targeting, and so Michael Merdinger ends up being the guy. And at the time. Carolina was really just taking a flyer on him. You didn't really know a whole lot about him. Um, you were going off of his previous stint as a starter at his previous high school in his sophomore year, which then eventually led him to transfer. So it, 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 there wasn't a lot to go off of. But, man, you turn on the tape. I watched it again tonight um, of his senior year, and you see exactly what Carolina was seeing in him. Uh, dude has a huge arm, uh, really fits exactly what Carolina has been looking for in their quarterbacks. Don't know if it's as strong as, you know, Sam Howell that we've seen, Drake Bay, uh, even to a certain extent, Connor Harrell, but definitely a guy that can push the ball down the field. Did it a ton this year for Cardinal Gibbons. Uh, that was really their offense, an extremely explosive offense because of how good he was at throwing the deep ball. And so I think that's really going to serve well. Really liked his footwork. I think he was a guy that was very steady in the pocket, um, You know, did, did a good job of setting his feet, allowing him to drive the football. Uh, isn't a guy that's going to run the ball a lot, but has that ability, sort of like what we saw from Drake May a little bit in high school. He wasn't a guy that Myers Park used in a lot of read option situations, anything like that. Carolina didn't use him in that way either, but a guy that can take off when he needs to and make plays with his legs. That's what I see from Mertinger on film. Also a guy that's pretty solid on the run. The thing is, is that it's always hard to tell. You don't know what guys look like under pressure because they're not going to put a lot of those reps on film uh, in their highlight tape. And again, you know, I'm not a guy that has access to all these guys' raw huddle tapes. Um, some of the other evaluators that uh, do this, you know, and, and, and rank these guys uh, clearly have a much better view of that. So who knows how he handles uh, legitimate pressure on him, but uh, he does have that ability when there is a money pocket to get out of there and has the ability to make plays on the run. So overall with Merdinger, I feel a lot better about him now than I felt when we initially uh, were talking about him when Carolina uh, brought him in. So I, I think that's one that Tar Heel fans should be pretty satisfied with. The running back position, this one's a little bit interesting because they bring in Davey and Gauss, and this is one that is kind of a little bit, you know, has gone in the opposite direction uh, since we talked about him when he committed. Now, he was one of the earliest commits to Carolina's class. 
And one of the things that we liked so much about him was a physical downhill running presence. And look, Carolina's had those types of guys the last uh, handful of years under Mac Brown. Javante Williams really succeeded in that role. Same thing we're seeing right now with Amari and Hampton. And I think Gauss has the potential to be that type of guy at 5'11", 215. The thing with him is, is that when you go back, you watch his junior film, extremely decisive runner, doesn't, you know, mess around when it comes to hitting the hole, which is what you want to see, especially from high school running backs, because there are times where those guys are going to try to make uh, the superstar plays. He's not the fastest guy, but really that physicality is something that is just so tough for defenders to stop. And look, he played at Chaminade Madonna Prep, and while some people ripped the level of competition in the state overall, um, you know, it, it's it, it, you look at them, they play a national schedule. Like, I know people rip their schedule, especially once they get into the playoffs. But, yeah, they're not in the greatest classification in the state of Florida. It's very similar, honestly, to Providence Day School. If you're someone that's in the Charlotte area or just in the state of North Carolina in general, you probably know about them. When they get to the playoffs, they don't always play the similar level of competition that they may play when they go at a conference. Um, but for Shaman Amadana, it's on a different level even than that. They're playing in nationally televised games. We saw them a few times early in the year where we were watching Davey and Gauss. The biggest problem for Gauss and the thing that's going to be concerning and that he'll have to answer when he gets on campus, he lost reps as the season went along. You didn't see him get the football nearly as much. Now, they did throw the football a lot. And when you got a guy like Jeremiah Smith, a five-star wide receiver that uh, I believe has signed his letter of intent with Ohio State, a little bit of drama there. He said he was committing there. Um, they, they they showed a video of him earlier today. Uh, if you're interested in just the national landscape, uh, showed a video of him earlier today. Basically looks like he doesn't even really sign his national letter of intent. Um, just kind of scribbles, hover, almost hovers the pen over the paper. Uh, just one of the weirdest situations, but an extremely talented prospect that it looked like Shaman Madonna was looking to try to get uh, the ball into his hands most of the year. So maybe that's part of it, but that's certainly something that Gauss is going to have to answer to after he was used so much the last three years uh, and succeeded at a really high level. Um, I still think it's one that Carolina, it's worth taking the risk on. Uh, this is a guy that goes to one of the best schools in the country for three years. He was incredibly productive. And I think we've seen Carolina's backfield, they have had a lot of success with the backs that they have brought in there. The biggest issue really uh, two years ago was that Carolina just could not stay healthy there. This year, this past season that just wrapped up as we get ready for the bowl game, uh, Omari and Hampton stayed healthy the entire year. You look at what Carolina was able to do with him and even the effectiveness that you saw at times from British Brooks when he was in the game. That's what you want to see. Um, and I think Davey and Gauss is a guy that's worth the risk. The wide receiver position. Now, this is the one that people probably want to know the most about, especially after the decommitment of Keenan Jackson. Carolina still brings in three guys in this class, and I see a lot of NC State fans that uh, were going after Tar Heel fans. Uh, I was one of them that, that decided to engage in it because there's times where I just can't help myself on social media where I said, look, I think Carolina will be fine. Now, the thing is, is that most people that I saw took that as me trying to slight Keenan Jackson. Look, I, I watched Keenan Jackson multiple times over the last few years. Every time I've seen him, I've loved the kid. State's getting a really good receiver. I think he's a guy that should have been more highly rated than he was. The fact that he was still a guy that was ranked in the 800s was – ridiculous to me and he probably would have been one of those guys uh when I talked about it that I, I would have considered as the most underrated prospect in this class for the Tar Heels but at the same time this group that they're bringing in don't get it wrong this is an outstanding group uh, it starts with Jordan Ship, who I think is great you talk about a guy that had a massive senior season yeah Keenan Jackson did but so did Jordan Ship. And you could argue he did it against a tougher uh, group of competition throughout the year. Um, and not to mention, he did it in a wide receiver room that is 
a little bit more stacked than Weddington's wide receiver room. Uh, I mean, you're talking about Shannon Goodwin, a guy who's a D1 recruit that's uh, going to be going to Michigan. Um, signed his letter of intent there earlier today. And then a couple other guys who we'll probably get to know here over the next couple of years on the recruiting trail as well at that position that I saw when I went and watched them play in Bank of America Stadium in the key pounding classic earlier this year. That was the game where Jordan Ship had 234 yards, three touchdowns in the game. He was absolutely outstanding in that ball game. And I think that was really just the start of it. Um, the thing about him, I mean, just uh, as complete of a receiver as you can get. So dangerous, um, you know, when, when he's running his route, uh, able to create separation with how good he runs his routes. Uh, a guy that, you know, when, when he's catching the football, uh, can win 50-50 balls in the air, um, is a guy that has very, very reliable hands, uh, maybe some of the most reliable in this class. And the thing is, is that once he catches the ball, he is an absolute monster in open space. Tremendous straight line speed, great shiftiness to add to it. So this is a guy that I think could, you know, with Carolina still, you know, going to be looking for guys uh, that can step up on the outside. They feel good with the group that they have. That's why they're not going to go into the transfer portal and bring someone in. I think that Jordan Ship, I know it's an outside shot. There's other guys who have been in the system. I'm not saying that I think he will be the starter, but don't rule it out that this guy could potentially be a factor in his first year because he really is just that talented. You look at you know the other guys that are here in this class. Alex Taylor, I, I'm not going to say similar to Davian Gauss, but he just – I think people were expecting a massive year from him. And he didn't have the type of season that we saw from Jordan Ship. Now, again, this is a guy that when you go back and watch it, one of the things I was worried about a little bit, um, and I wrote this in the article and I talked about it a little bit the other night um, or last night when I was talking about the decommitment of Keenan Jackson was guys that could win the 50-50 balls. When I went back and watched Alex Taylor and Jordan Ship, I watched both guys and I said to myself, look, these are guys that aren't built like Keenan Jackson, Keenan Jackson has the height, a little bit taller, so that allows him uh, to thrive in those jump ball situations. But these are guys that can still win the contested catches in Taylor and Ship. And Alex Taylor, I mean, you look at it, probably the most raw talent of anybody in this class. You go back to his junior tape, uh, this guy was a guy that was probably going to be inside the top 200 uh, on just about every site across the board. Um, this year, you know, the performance that he had, um, his his uh, fellow wide receiver, Terrell Anderson, was the guy uh, that really took over in that offense. Uh, that's a guy that is going to NC State. Um, but, you know, you would have liked Taylor to be the guy that shined. But still, I think there is a ton of uh, talent there. Um, again, he's another guy uh, that can affect the game really at, at all three levels. Very similar to Ship. But he really shines in the deep and intermediate portions of the field, which is what Carolina really, really likes in their receivers. Yeah, they like the guys that can help them in the short passing game. Really, they look to their tight ends and their slot receivers to do that, though. When you're guys that play on the outside, which is where you're hoping Alex Taylor will be able to play for you, um, that then you like a guy that is able uh, to really settle in in, in those, those deep, to intermediate areas, and that's exactly what you see from Alex Taylor. Um, he's a guy that uh, you know has some nice twitch. He's not you know one of those guys like Orion Switzer or some of the other guys that we've seen Josh Downs uh, even more so that can free themselves up with their route running. But at the same time, he's still a guy uh, that I think a lot of people uh, will really really like. Uh, once they get to see him there, um, he, he's a guy that probably fits in on the outside, um, but is still a guy that could get a look potentially in the slot. Very similar uh, to Kobe Pace, where I think that's uh, the type of player that he, he most uh, mostly compares to on this current roster. Then you go inside to the slot. And that's where you get Javarius Green. Uh, this is your fast, twitchy guy. Um, perfect fit for a slot receiver, uh, the type of guy that Lonnie Galloway really likes to plug in there. I mean, look, dude runs a 4-3-9, 40-yard dash. Uh, it is all over his film 
uh, in terms of being able to create separation before the catch and his acceleration once he has the ball in his hands. Um, you know, he, he really does a great job. You know, we, we heard it a lot uh, under, uh, Phil, under Phil Longo when he first took over. One of the things that we heard him say, uh, you know, in his first year and, and really the first couple of years that he wanted from his receivers and tight ends was just to find grass. And that's exactly what Javarius Green does. He finds the soft spots uh, in the defense and consistently makes plays over and over again. Another guy that had a really strong senior year at Crest High School in Shelby. I think this is a guy that should have been a four-star wide receiver just from watching him um, both on his junior tape and on his senior tape. Um, it's a guy that I, I think Carolina fans, he, he might not be the headliners like Ship and Taylor or guys that everybody knows, but he's a name that you should become familiar with if you're not because he's going to be a big part of this receiving core, I think, moving forward. Let's move to the tight end group, and Carolina brings in two guys in this class. The first one uh, that they did bring in, uh, the highest rated of the two, is Timothy Lawson. And not going to have time to go through the superlatives like we normally do. Uh, again, we got a game that's coming on uh, that is extremely important uh, for Carolina basketball against Oklahoma. So we're going to, of course, want to get you on your way to that. But Timothy Lawson is going to be the guy that I'm looking at as probably my most underrated player, especially on the offensive side of the ball. There's another guy that stands out to me defensively that I'll tell you about here in just a second. But when you look at Timothy Lawson, first of all, there is the element of baseball with him. He's a baseball pitcher, uh, a guy that uh, throws right around about 90 miles an hour. Really, really good prospect that is going to play both sports at Carolina. So, uh, look, if he sticks with football, I think Carolina is getting a tight end that has one really great frame, 6'5", 220, something that Carolina can build on. Um, but the thing that you like the most about him is that he stretches the field, thrives in the intermediate and deep passing games, which is something that Carolina lacked for a long, long time with their tight ends. They're going to need somebody to be able to do that once Bryson Nesbitt leaves campus and you would imagine seems like he is going to end up coming back next year um barring a, a last minute decision from him it seems like he is going to stay put he's not going to play in the bowl game but that is due to injury um so with him still in place that'll give a guy like Lawson Julian Randolph who was in the last class and even another guy who we'll tell you about here in a minute and Ryan Ward a little bit of a chance to develop um, the thing is, is that, you know, he, he really fits that receiver type role um, blocking wise as with most tight ends, probably the biggest question with him, uh, you know, coming out of high school. But look, the reps that we've seen from him on tape, there is a lot of promise there. This is a guy that uh, is really strong, good hand placement. I think he's got a chance to be a really good player. Concern with him. The the uh, the two A the two S classification in the state of Florida, uh, really an independent, basically an independent type of league um, uh, that that you see here in the state of North Carolina, kind of like the uh, NSIA. Uh, um, I think still uh, a really good player. I know the level of competition isn't great, but I still think that he's a guy um, that if he sticks with football. Carolina has a chance to develop into something. Ryan Ward, also a very typical type of receiver. This one even more so. Um, Ward, you go back and watch how Rutherford High School up there in New Jersey used him, basically played him as a wide receiver. So he doesn't have a lot of reps as an inline tight end. Uh, that's going to be a little bit of a learning curve for him having to get into a stance consistently. Um, in terms of blocking, you would imagine – that's probably the biggest thing that is in question for him. Uh, did you know a good job of blocking corners uh, out there when, when he's uh, matched up against them as a receiver or in the slot? Problem is, is that you're going to have to go up against defensive linemen, linebackers at this level. So for him, really feels like there's more of a learning curve for him than there is for Lawson. Still a guy, though, that I think has a chance to come in here and develop. And with what we've seen you know, this year, I thought the tight ends even took another step under uh, under the direction of Freddie Kitchens. I thought they were a much better blocking unit this year than they were last year. I think that uh, th there is a chance uh, for Carolina, at least, uh, that they are uh, developing a pretty good future here with guys 
like Ward, like Lawson, and Julian Randolph, where they may not have to go into the transfer portal uh, like they had to do this time around with Jake Johnson. You go to the offensive line. Carolina loaded up here as they need to. And look, uh, they, they kind of mixed and matched here. You got some guys that uh, I think really fit the pass protection uh, type scheme, uh, which is, you know, guys – uh, like Andrew Rosinski, still really physical guy. Guys, the guy that is a four star. Um, I think with him, uh, you know, the, the the thing that you like the most about him really is his run blocking. Um, but I love the athleticism. Not a guy that had to pass protect a lot, mainly because of the scheme that they ran. But I think you look at the way that he moves. His footwork is really, really good. I think there's a lot of potential here for him, and there's a reason why he ended up becoming a composite four-star prospect. But the thing is, a guy that can get downhill, um, plays with a, a lot of physicality, I think this is a guy that Carolina uh, could see potentially playing early. Now, he needs to add some weight, slight of frame, uh, just 275. Now, again, that was something of a lot of these websites, when they end up putting these guys in the system. It's rare. They'll, they'll change just about everything else, especially when it comes to their interest uh, and how you know schools are doing with them. But in terms of their height and weight, usually they'll leave those all the same. So they have him measuring out 6'6", um, 275. Um, so he will have to add some weight. Carolina typically likes to have their alignment, as we've seen the last few years, around 300 pounds. So if he can get there, it's going to take him probably a little bit of time, which is expected for guys coming out of high school, especially tackles. But I, I think he's a guy uh, that really has a, a, a strong skill set that I think will lend well to a Tar Heel offensive line uh, that sorely needs it. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the real true pass protector, that is where you turn to Luke Basterson. That's exactly uh, what he does. Uh, we, we saw it so much um, I, 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 on his high school tape at Franklin Road Academy in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he is outstanding in pass protection. Uh, that's really the area that stood out most to me about him. And that's something that Carolina really, really needs. They need a quality pass protector because we've seen it as the year rolls along. And part of that is that guys get worn down and Carolina's got to do a better job of being able to to rotate guys from time to time. But the other part of it is that towards the end of the year, some of the cracks start to show through um, with some of these guys that maybe just aren't as good of pass protectors as they seem early in the season. Uh, we saw it again this year. When you face some of these defensive lines that have really, really good pass rushers, um, you know it, it, this group really struggles. Clemson, NC State were really able to get after the quarterback. Same schools last year, along with uh, Georgia Tech, who had a great pass rusher, and Keon White did the same thing. So you're hoping that you can find guys that are pass protection specialists. Uh, the thing with him is, is he going to be able to win uh, in the rundowns? Probably the one guy out of this group that Carolina is bringing in that isn't a great run blocker. So uh, it'll be interesting. That's an area Carolina is going to have to work with him on, and it's really – one of the only guys that we've had to say that about here in a while. I think, you know, you go back to Eli Sutton, that's probably another guy coming out of high school that was a better pass protector than he was a run blocker. And so far, Eli Sutton hasn't really seen the field all that much. So I think that tells you what Carolina is looking for. Masterson, he'll have to prove to the staff that he is able to, uh, to run block at a high level before he probably – gets himself some significant reps. Then you go to the guys on the interior of this unit. Now, Desmond Jackson is a guy that's listed as an offensive tackle. Just from watching him, though, I, I look at him. He's a guy that just overpowers everybody in the run game, incredibly physical. Um, you know, in terms of, of him as a pass protector, he didn't really do that much at the high school level. And I think with his frame – you do kind of wonder if he's a guy that would be able to hold up a tackle. That's the reason why I think he probably fits a little bit more at guard. Um, there are, you know, a couple of sites, both on three sports and ESPN have him on the interior, whereas the other sites have him as an offensive tackle. 
I think this is one of those guys Carolina's got to figure out where he fits. And we'll talk a lot about that when we get over to the other side of the ball defensively uh, because there are a lot of guys that are sort of in between positions. This is a guy, though, that I think just from watching him, he has enough physicality to play inside, especially in the run game. I think that's probably the area that you want to play Desmond Jackson and probably sets him up for the most success. A guy that we know is going to play inside and a guy that plays with a ton of physicality and probably is right up there with Timothy Lawson as one of the most underrated guys in this class is Aiden Banfield. Um, I, I mean, physicality is the first thing that you notice about him. Ton of pancake blocks. Him and Desmond Jackson are the guy that pi- guys that pile them up the most of anybody in this class. I mean, just, I, I mean, w- when I was going through the, the, the things that came to mind, the stuff that I wrote down about him, um, you know, especially on pull blocks, just absolutely steamrolls defenders. Um, you know, d- d- just a, a mauler, a guy that can beat you into the ground. Those are the types of things that you want for Carolina on the offensive line. Because one of the biggest things that I think Carolina still has a problem with, didn't show up a lot early in the season for Carolina, but as the season wore along, the more physical teams were really able to get after and dominate Carolina's offensive line. You need guys that are going to match that intensity. I think Aiden Banfield, just from watching his tape coming out of high school, is the type of guy that can do that. And the thing is, is that out of that guard spot, as a pass protector, he is a really, really good pass protector. And that's an area where, look, Carolina – This year, I thought was much better pass protecting on the interior of the offensive line. Um, I think, you know, most of the breakdowns came at the tackle spots, but it's an area that Carolina needs to build on even more moving forward because you saw inconsistencies at times, even this year, from guys like Ed Montalus and William Barnes when he was in there. A guy like Banfield that has good lateral movement, moves his feet very well. I think that's a guy that you can be very excited about. Does need to put on a little bit of weight at just 6'3", 280. Again, could have put on more weight as a senior. But uh, still, that's the guy that, that's a guy that needs to put on a little more size if he is going to play uh, sometime soon at the college level. And then the final guy that we have to talk about here, and this is one that actually works out perfect because it kind of carries us over to the other side of the ball is Johnny Norwood, the interior offensive lineman slash defensive lineman from Eastern Randolph High School uh, in Ramsar, North Carolina. Uh, Look, talented guy, one that I think, uh, you know, could play either side of the football. Uh, He's pushing for that, had his another year of experience under his belt on the defensive side of the ball. I got to be honest, though, even going back and watching again this year, you can see that he is experienced on the offensive side of the ball. He's a guy that's been playing there. He was a starter as a freshman at Eastern Randolph High School on the offensive line. It's the more comfortable position for him. And I think it's a position that Carolina still needs help on in the interior of that offensive line. Um, moving forward, they need to get some guys in there because even you know some of the guys that are still going to be there next year, a lot of upperclassmen that will be moving out of there. So uh, Carolina needs some young guys that they can rely on there moving forward. I watch them on the offensive side of the ball, and I think you know a- another guy that just overpowers guys, gets downhill, heavy hands, um, great upper body strength, really promising footwork in pass protection. I think that's probably why I would stick with him on the offensive side of the ball. But he is talking to, uh, you know, Tim Cross was at the the time, at least uh, when he committed. Randy Clements and Tim Cross were both talking to him. Both guys said, look, we have a position for you if you want it. So it'll be interesting. I think Carolina, one of the biggest things they've got to do, and they've got to do it early, is they got to figure out his position. We saw this before. A guy that was here under Mac Brown was a part of his first class that was sort of doing the same thing was wisdom Osaburo and he was never able to settle in now wisdom a little bit more raw Johnny Norwood already has the size on him that was the thing with Osaburo they were trying to add so much weight to him to try to get him to fit either one of the positions and when you don't know your position that's even tougher um, but I, I think Norwood if they can figure out what side of the ball they want to play him on they have a chance 
uh, to turn him into a really successful player. That leads us to the defensive side of the ball, and you start on the defensive line. Let's talk about the edge rushers first that Carolina is bringing in. There's two of them. The most highly rated one uh, is a guy that's not even listed officially as an edge rusher, according to 24-7 Sports. Uh, now, you look at some of the other sites, and a lot of them have him listed as a defensive end, as an edge rusher, and that's Curtis Simpson, uh, the guy out of Kings Mountain High School. Very raw, a guy that fits the billing uh, of, uh, you know, someone that Carolina has brought in the last few years. Um, this one, another one that's very, very undersized, very similar to Malachi Hamrick that Carolina brought in a couple of years ago in uh, that recruiting class, 6'3", 200 pounds. Now, again, that was probably his weight before his junior year. But even still, you'd imagine uh, with the amount of success that he had off the edge, uh, very similar type of production numbers to what you saw from Malachi Hamrick when he was back in high school at Shelby High School, that they didn't really do much to his frame. They kept him small. He looked like it on film. Uh, and this is a guy that, you know, is going to take some time to develop. Uh, I think, you know, you want some of those speed rushers. That's de There's definitely a spot for those guys on your roster. Uh, but this is a guy that, you know, is even thinner than the two guys that you brought in in last year's class and Tyler Thompson and J. Brown Harvey, who are going to take time to develop uh, and really just, I, I think, relies solely on his speed and a little bit of te technical pass rush ability. The thing for him is, is yes, he's going to have to develop that physical side of the game. That's an absolute must if you're going to play on the defensive line. The other thing is, is he has to become a more complete technical pass rusher. He does rely on that speed a lot at the high school level. It's going to work for you, especially at Kings Mountain. That's a uh, even though uh, that is they are playing at the top level of uh, of high school football in the state. It's still you know one that in the conference that they play in can probably win you some games. But the thing is, is that um, you know there is a little bit of technical ability there. So I think this is one that. Fits that mold of some of the guys that Carolina has been bringing in in the last two, three years on that defensive side of the football where you're going to have to add a lot of weight, but you like what they bring in terms of their speed element. So this is one that is probably a long-term project for Carolina, but one that could end up working out and uh, turning into one of the more explosive players in the class because of his speed, because of his ability to get off the line of scrimmage. A guy that probably fits in a little bit more uh, right out of the gate is Daniel Anderson, the edge rusher out of Germantown High School in Germantown, Tennessee, plays uh, or played his high school football now that his season has concluded under Gene Robinson the third, a guy that, uh, of course, uh, went to Carolina, uh, was a big part of uh, Carolina's secondaries in the late 2000s uh, into the early 2010s. Um, you know, Daniel Anderson, a, a guy that, I think, you know, still has the speed, um, you know, guy that's probably got to put on a little bit of weight, not quite as quick off the edge as Curtis Simpson is, but still really good speed. And that's what allows him uh, to win a lot of reps. Great release off the line of scrimmage. Tackles have so many issues staying in front of him. Uh, not the most physical player. Didn't have to use it a lot at the high school level because he was able to win so much with his speed and release off the line of scrimmage. But I think it's it's something that is there it's, it's a guy that you can develop, um, you know, especially, uh, you know, he's going to have to do that when he's going against some of the bigger linemen that he's going to face in the ACC. But I really, really like Daniel Anderson a lot. And this is my guy on the defensive side of the football that I really think uh, has a ton of upside, is a developmental guy uh, that I think is not being talked about enough. Expect him to be a big part of what Carolina does uh, moving forward in the future as an edge rusher. Then you go to the interior of the unit. Two guys coming in there for Carolina there. Have to start speeding things up just here a little bit, guys, as we're getting closer and closer to Carolina's game against Oklahoma uh, coming up over on ESPN. Still a lot of time to go in the game. Uh, Duke and Baylor not even to the under four timeout just yet. So I'm uh, going to speed it up, though, just a little bit so that we can get you guys there. Peter Pisansky, a uh, guy that Carolina's had in their class for a long time. Uh, a little bit smaller for a defensive, uh, for an interior defensive lineman, uh, 6'3", 276, solid frame, one that he can build off of, really good pass rusher. 
Um, really like that about him. Uh, I think he probably, if they can put some more weight on him as a guy that Carolina will look to use, similar to what they thought they were going to be able to get out of Tamari Fox, who had a solid year, but they probably expected a little bit more in terms of the pass rush. Um, not the most physical guy, and that's something that he's really going to have to develop if he's going to play on the interior of the defensive line. And that's the biggest reason why he is a little bit of a project for Carolina uh, on the interior of that unit. Uh, then there's Leroy Jackson. Um, he's a guy that you know I, Carolina added late in the class, um, but still a lot of promise for him. Great job at shedding blockers. Um, does a great job of, of getting his hands uh, in the right position to be able to shed and really combines a good uh, mix of speed and power, which is exactly what you want to see. Good athleticism as well. The thing about him, reason why he is so low, lowly rated and why it is a bit of a risk, one-year producer at the high school level. Um, he's going to have to prove that this year that he had at the high school level wasn't just a flash in the pan. And if it's not, it could work out very, very well for Carolina along that defensive line. But there is a lot of work to do uh, to be able to develop him. The good news is Carolina's got plenty of depth there. A lot of guys that still have pretty good amount of time remaining, including a couple of guys that Carolina brought in last year. So it's not like they're in a rush to have to get those guys out there. Let's talk about the trio that Carolina has at the linebacker position. And all these guys – honestly, are very similar to each other. And that's probably the one thing that is a little bit scary. We'll say this. I think Ashton Woods very clearly is head and shoulders above the other two guys that are in this class. And really, the only reason that he is is that he is a guy that's uh, able to get out in space and cover. Uh, the other two guys in this class really haven't done it at all in their time in high school, especially Cruz Law, who we'll talk about here in a minute. So Ashton Woods... Uh, I think is a guy that, you know, when I watched him, first thing that stuck out to me, the words that I wrote down were fluid in coverage, especially for a linebacker, uh, has good closing speed, allows him to make uh, plays on the football. And that's also a big part of what allows him to be so successful when it comes to getting downhill and tackling. He plays with that aggressive mindset, really might be the most aggressive of any of these three guys when it comes to getting downhill, loves physicality. Um, he's a guy that's been dropping in some of the rankings, and honestly, I can't really tell you why because I, I, I've loved everything that I've seen from this kid. Uh, you know, Watched his junior film again, which really was great, and then even looked at his senior film, couldn't really understand why people are so down on him. I think he's a guy, though, that for Carolina – really, really fits what they want to have in their linebackers. So I like him as probably the best linebacker out of this group moving forward. Doesn't mean anything against the other two guys. Cruz Law is a guy that just hasn't been asked to cover. Don't know if he has the ability to do so. I will say this, though. This is a guy that in the run game can cover everything. Sideline to sideline, fantastic. Guy that can get downhill and make guys pay in the hole. Uh, an aggressive player in space but also takes smart angles to the football. It's everything that you want in your linebackers. And so I think this is a guy that if Carolina can get him into the system, if they can develop him a little bit as a coverage man, we saw it you know, with Power Eccles. That wasn't really something that he had to do a ton of in high school. Um, but, you know, Cruz Law fits into that, uh, under that same umbrella. If they can turn him into a guy – that can cover a little bit in space, he has a chance to be a really successful linebacker, but that is a pretty big if. And then Evan Bennett, guy that is a pretty raw prospect, even still after his senior year. Biggest concern with him, though, is the level of competition. Uh, playing at the GIAA 2A level, so the independent league in the state of Georgia, didn't face uh, great competition at all. You watch his film. Uh, guys that are uh, really, really undersized. Don't know if there are any other prospects, honestly, coming out of that entire classification uh, that have been recruited. So this is a significant step up. That's the biggest concern for me. Other than that, you know, I kind of like his frame. I think he has to add to it a little bit, a, a little bit more. Um, you know, looks good when he has dropped into coverage, but doesn't really do that a lot on film at all. Um, and the thing about him is, is he has to become more physical. He didn't really have to do a lot of that, um, mainly because he was just so fast going against these less talented players uh, that they simply could not get hands on him. 
at this level, not going to be anywhere near the same. So I think with him, he's a guy that has a long, a huge, huge learning curve when he comes to Carolina. Now let's talk about the most loaded group that Carolina brought in in this class, and that is the defensive backfield. So many different guys here that are going to have a major effect. It starts with the big fish from the state, the top-rated player in the class, according to uh, 24-7 composite rankings on three sports, uh, as well as uh, ESPN uh, and even uh, 24-7 sports. Uh, uh, no, 24-7 sports, excuse me, has uh, another member of the defensive back class, Jaden Patterson, who we'll talk about here in just a minute as their top-rated guy. But Ziegler, Malcolm Ziegler, the four-star uh, safety out of Fuquay Verina High School uh, in Fuquay Verina, North Carolina, is another guy uh, that is an outstanding player. Uh, really exciting film to watch when you turn it on from him. Uh, very versatile guy, plays safety, corner, uh, really focused on safety this year. The speed is as good as it gets. He can stay with just about anybody, covers a lot of space really, really quickly, and that's what allows him to make plays on the football. Uh, his coverage skills are, are, are very, very good, always seems to be in the hip pocket, thrives in both zone and man coverage, which is great. Carolina likes to mix and match with that at times throughout the year. Um, and, and I think the thing is, you know, with him, you're probably looking for him to be a little bit more aggressive in run defense. I think that's something that you could see more of come out uh, you know, when he gets to this level, Fuquay Verina, um, not the highest level of, of play. That That's the classification, uh, classification. I believe they're 3A in the state of North Carolina. And look, in years past, that was a pretty strong classification. As we've gone throughout the years and they've sort of brought a lot of the big name schools up to 4A and made that the premier classification, you see when you watch games of, of Fuquay Verinas, I did earlier this year, that the talent level isn't nearly as high. Um, you know, the thing with Ziegler, one of the things I watched with him that, you know, kind of concerned me a little bit watching one of his games wasn't incredibly active. So you do wonder just a little bit about the motor, but I think that's a guy that's motivated. He has the skill set when he gets here. You would hope that Mac Brown and the staff can re energize him and get him ready to go. Um, you look at, you know, the other guys in this class, a couple of safeties, by the way, 9-10 tip off for uh, Carolina, Oklahoma. So I'm going to wrap it up here uh, real quick, uh, running through the rest of these guys here, and it'll be a short wrap up on the end of it. Uh, Jaden Patterson, the uh, defensive back, four-star out of Mill Creek High School in Houston, Georgia, guy that has made a major, major climb. Uh, and it makes sense. He was a guy that, you know, last year, was stuck in a uh, defensive backfield where Caleb Downs was the biggest standout. Uh, they had a couple other guys, Trajan Greco, who was a member of this class, uh, that was also getting some focus. This year, it was just him and Greco that were the main guys back there. Uh, people were able to get a really good look at him. And this guy is, you talk about versatility. I mean, this is as versatile as it gets. A guy that can play safety, played outside corner, played nickelback. He can do everything for Carolina. They're going to love him. Uh, his speed I think is outstanding. That's part of the reason why he can play safety. No problem. A guy that does like to get downhill will get in there, make tackles in the run game. Um, I, I mean, he can do just about everything. His coverage ability, uh, I think, is outstanding. Uh, covers about as good as uh, just about any corner that Carolina has brought in here in, in the last couple of years. So that tells you the type of player that he is. Carolina can use him uh, all over the place. Biggest thing for him is they got to figure out where they're going to play him. Tyshawn White, another guy out of the state of Georgia, played at Buford High School, Carolina, able to hold on to him. That was a big one. Uh, with him, biggest thing that you wonder about with him is what he does in coverage. Didn't see a whole lot of it, especially with how uh, some of these high school offenses are run that are so run-based. Didn't have to see him cover in space a lot. But I think he's a guy that is capable of doing that. More than anything, he's a guy that loves playing the run. Downhill safety, comes up into the box, makes plays repeatedly on film. Very quick. That's the thing that allows me to think that he'll be able to cover uh, in space very quickly. And, uh, you know, the thing that I like the most about him, talk about guys that play with physicality. Yeah, he's coming downhill. He's a punishing tackler. He fights through blocks. That's what you want to see from safeties that are going to come up into the box and play the run, which Carolina needs 
uh, especially here in recent years with the way that their defensive line at times has been pushed back off the line of scrimmage. Uh, another guy that you look at um, in this class at the defensive uh, in the defensive backfield uh, that Carolina has brought in here is Jalen Thompson. One of those guys that when Carolina landed him initially, I said to myself, I don't really understand this one. I felt like there were other targets that Carolina could have gone after at the safety position. Now, of course, this was before Carolina had landed Malcolm Ziegler, and that was really my biggest concern at the time. It uh, turns out it didn't affect that, and part of the reason why is that, again, another versatile piece in that defensive backfield, uh, a guy that you know can cover one-on-one, -on -one, all-region track uh, runner, outstanding player um, you know, that can cover in both man and zone coverage. Um, and just a tremendous job of making plays on the football. Carolina needs those types of guys that uh, can play the ball, um, you know, for, force pass breakups, uh, come away with interceptions, create turnovers. That's what Carolina is needing. Um, and, and I think the biggest thing for him, again, figure out where he fits. But the thing is, with the speed and knows that he has – for the football, he's a guy that's going to fit in somewhere on this defense. I think probably as it goes along, he'll probably fit in a little bit more as a safety, but I could see him really fitting in at either spot, which is what Carolina really needs in that defensive backfield with some of the injury issues that they've had, uh, it seems, year over year. Then you get to Khalil Conley. Uh, now this one, go back to when we were first talking about this class. I absolutely loved Khalil Conley, and for good reason explosive is the way to describe him. One of the fastest guys that you will watch on tape that speed carried over again this year. The biggest thing about him is though, where does he actually fit in? He's going to be somewhere in the defensive backfield, but is he a guy that Carolina wants to play at safety? I think with that speed, he would be able to cover a ton of ground very quickly. Um, you know, pretty solid tackler. I think that's still an area you'd like to see him shore up a little bit. Or is he a guy that Carolina wants to use at the nickel corner spot? The thing with that is, is, is he a guy that can handle physicality? Love the athleticism. I think he's really one of the best pure athletes that Carolina has in this class. But because of you know him, him being a guy that really just gets by on his athleticism, it's important for Carolina to, you know, add a little bit, you know, show him how important physicality is and more importantly, figure out where he's going to play. Are they going to play him at safety? Do they like him a little bit better at nickel corner? If they can figure that out, and I think Carolina will be in a good spot with him. Um, that rounds out the – just uh, want to make sure. That rounds out all of the high school guys. There is one last guy. Uh, cornerback Tyrane Stewart, the guy that Carolina just brought in, told you a little bit about him last night on uh, the podcast, broke him down. Look, love this pickup for Carolina because it's a low-risk, high-reward type pickup. He's a guy that has a little bit of added experience over the guys that are coming in in this class straight out of high school, a uh, guy that his hips open up very fluidly. Um, and I think, you know, thrives most in press man situations. You wonder if that's sort of saying something about what Carolina's scheme will look like moving forward. Love the physicality, likes to get his hands on receivers uh, to th sort of throw them off their routes. And also uh, is part of the reason why he was a team leader in tackles, uh, led all defensive backs in tackles this year uh, over there at East Mississippi Community College, a team that went to the JUCO National Championship game uh, last week, uh, actually a week from uh, tonight on the night of recording. Uh, so uh, a guy that I think fits in well for Carolina and is worth taking the risk on. Last guy, really quickly, then going to do a quick wrap up to get you out of here. Uh, that Carolina brought in three-star kicker slash punter Lucas Asada, a uh, powerful leg guy that I think uh, probably fits that punter role more than he fits the kicking role. Carolina also needs a little bit of depth there. I think he is going to fit in perfectly for Carolina. 21 of these 27 will enroll early. Mac Brown said that today earlier in his presser. When we find out who those guys are, we will, of course, tell you who is enrolling early and who will get a jump start on their Carolina career to be with the team in the spring. But for now, that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. Guys, so happy that we can be back on camera. Hopefully the internet will hold up here. We'll be able to do more editions 
on camera moving forward without me having to stay late at work. But for now, it's time to step away. It's time to go watch some Carolina basketball. Huge game for the Tar Heels in Charlotte against the number seven Oklahoma Sooners. Head over to ESPN right now. Duke Baylor about to finish up. Unfortunately, the Blue Devils look like they're going to get a win. But the Tar Heels with a chance to get a massive victory over a top 10 ranked team over on ESPN uh, head over there now, guys. Really appreciate those that have stuck through, though. Listen to this edition of the podcast. Check out the article on the website, breaking down all of the commitments a little bit further in depth for you guys. Uh, but once again, thanks for watching this, uh, watching and listening to this edition of the podcast. And as always, go Tar Heels.